Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon. It's quite uh, amazing to see so many faces. It's awesome. Uh, deep learning is obviously a, a hot topic, uh, both here and across the industry. Uh, what Gav and I are going to talk about today is sort of some practical, some practical aspects and how you might apply deep learning and uh, get going and get started with deep learning. So, I mean, why are we here? I mean, that's a fairly existential question, but, um, you know, deep learning across the board is, uh, is sort of on fire. It's, it's the new paradigm, it's the new way of programming, or it's the new way of getting a computer to do something. As I mentioned, this talk today is sort of has a practical aspect to it. Uh, I don't know if anyone caught Brian's talk that uh, just happened. His was more the inspirational side. Uh, we're going to go through and actually look at ways to actually use deep learning. Also, if you're staying in the area, we do have the GPU technology conference on next week. And that has a brilliant gaming track on the Monday. So in only a few, a few days' time, we did that on purpose because obviously uh, a lot of game developers in the area. Uh, you might want to stay over and uh, have a look at that as well and be inspired. So one of the things uh, we get asked a lot is, how do you do deep learning? And I'm no James Brown, but I can give you some help on that. And really, uh, deep learning is not a completely new thing. A lot of the skills you've already picked up, and especially uh, games programs we find in particular, are actually very good at deep learning. One of the big changes, though, is rather than uh, doing what we have traditionally done, which is think of a problem, break it down into rules, and then go away and program each individual thing. It becomes more of a statistical problem. We have a, uh, some sort of solution that we're searching for. We have a whole s big giant set of data. And what we try to do with deep learning is have the machine work out this highly complicated statistical function that takes uh, an input and generates the output that we're looking for. Now, if you go and look online, uh, that's kind of the message you get. But what a lot of the online courses will miss is that traditional programming forms a huge part of the practicality of actually rolling this stuff out and actually using deep learning. You have to put your data set somewhere. You have to pre-process it. You have to uh, load it into memory. You have to swizzle bits around and make sure the byte ordering is correct. And all of that is stuff, as game programmers and game developers, you know, we know well. We know how to optimize for RAM usage. We know how to look for hotspots in code to make things run faster. So fear not when you sort of take this step and, and head into deep learning. Uh, a lot of the skills you already know are going to be highly applicable. Uh, the other thing you do have to do, though, is allocate time to go and learn this. It is a new skill. Uh, I'm not suggesting you, you know, stop everything, go back to college, though uh, that would kind of be fun. Uh, there are a lot of online courses, but they do take time. And uh, for any directors and company owners out there, do give your programmers enough time to go and learn this skill. Indeed, within NVIDIA, you know, we have people doing courses all the time, and we mix uh, your own time, weekend time, with, with work time as well. Uh, we think it's very valuable, this skill that people are picking up. Uh, the other point, uh, which I'll give you a heads up and you can thank me in 24 months, is collect data. You will have heard this all across the board. Deep learning loves data. The more data you can get, the better. And you have a lot of data if you look at server logs, uh, crash reports, user t statistics, behaviors, QA reports, um, check-ins, all this type of thing. Look to, s to keep it somewhere. You know, storage is cheap. Don't go and throw it away, even if you can't think of an exact purpose to use it for right now. Keep that data, and uh, as I say, you'll thank me in a year or two's time. So the first step is learning deep learning. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of online courses. There are university courses as well. This is just a, a very brief summary of some of the ones that we've used uh, in my team. 
There's some uh, constantly new ones coming out, and by all means, look across the internet. There, there are tons there available. The other thing uh, which NVIDIA has started doing is offering what we call the Deep Learning Institute. So this is a, a group within NVIDIA that's made up of educators, uh, researchers, and former uh, driver engineers and graphics programmers. So it's a, it's a really good cross-section of the company. And they've put together hands-on teaching labs. We have two of these running tomorrow. You're more than welcome to attend. And um, one of my colleagues pointed out, you know, make sure they realize these are not toys. Like, this is cutting-edge stuff that you actually learn. So uh, the two labs tomorrow will be dealing with something that Gav is going to talk about later, and uh, the, the StarCraft II API, and using reinforcement learning to actually build an agent that can go and interface with that game and play that game. We're also running the DLIs uh, next week at the GPU conference. Uh, there's this whole set, uh, I think it's 30 or 40, and you can go and do hands-on. And then they're also available online. So please do go and have a look at those, especially, especially if you have uh, people in your team who want to learn deep learning. Now I added this uh, sort of slide in to sort of emphasize what I'm going to be talking about next because, uh, you know, I've done the old thing of made an assumption. What I've picked up on for the last few times I've talked to developers is that deep learning has two very distinct phases. It has a training phase and an inference phase. So you can think of these in gaming terms, like the, the training phase is when you're, you're baking, you know, or you're compiling. You're building something in advance. And that's typically the, the phase that takes a long time, takes a lot of computation. Uh, you can do it on your desktop, you can do it in the cloud, you can do it on one of our, our DGX servers, and it might take minutes or hours or days, or in some cases, uh, one of my engineers came and told me, yeah, that's going to be 28 months. Uh, and I said, yeah, you better go back and see if we can trim that down, down a little. Then what you're doing there, as I uh, mentioned, that giant statistical function, that's what the training is doing. It's working out all the parameters for that statistical function that a human would never be able to do. And it's doing millions and billions and quadrillions of iterations to pick the perfect weights and the perfect values for all these different parameters. Once you have that in a model, then you can go to inference. And that's the, the faster side. And, and personally, that's, for me, the, the more exciting side. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a little. So first, let's look at training. And actually, hands up, who, who has done some deep learning training? OK. So I see tears in all your eyes, because it's a pain. Uh, it, it reminds me, uh, I used to be a Linux admin, and it reminds me of setting up web servers and databases on Linux in the late 90s. Everything is dependent on everything. And you, you like touch one card, and the whole house of cards comes falling down. And that's kind of what this feels like at the moment. Um, added to that, the level of and speed of innovation uh, that's going on in the deep learning community is so fast. It's really hard to keep up. So you might, you know, we spent five days when a new version of uh, TensorFlow came out just to get that version working on the GPU that we had. And this was happening all across the company. And uh, our CEO, Jensen, he doesn't like that type of thing. Uh, and he has a very polite and uh, convincing way of sort of telling people when they're doing something stupid. And he looked, and you know, the automotive team, and our team, and the robotics team were wasting all this time every time a new framework came out, or every time a new version of CUDA was released. So we now have a team that goes through and has this expertise of knowing the right driver and the right uh, uh, CUDA version and the right framework and making sure everything's nicely optimized. And that led to NVIDIA creating deep learning containers. Now, containers uh, you might have heard of, and as the name suggests, they contain everything that you need to do your job. And rather than 50 teams running out and installing stuff manually on their boxes, we now have a, a group at NVIDIA that make these containers, and we all access them. So if I want a version of 
uh, PyTorch that works on uh, uh, 1070, you know, fully optimized for that, I go and grab that container. And then in a month's time, I want an MXNet that runs on a VoltaCut. I go and grab that. And I can have both running on my system. And they won't clash with each other, because that's one of the other problems that, again, reminds me of Linux in the old days, is you install one framework, and suddenly the other one doesn't work. Or, heaven forbid, you should have Python 3 and Python 2, and now you're in a world of pain. So containers are brilliant, and I love them. And uh, the more we can spread that love, the better. So as I mentioned, we, we cover all the major frameworks. And indeed, NVIDIA accelerates all the frameworks. Uh, Brian, uh, who spoke in the previous uh, session, uh, was one of the inventors of QDNN. And that sits underneath uh, every uh, deep learning framework so that you can be sure that when you want something to run fast and run, want it to run on the GPU, uh, NVIDIA has done the work to make that happen. Also, uh, the CUDA, sort of the base container is in there, because if you want to do something custom, uh, so there was a particular project, we, we needed three frameworks and all in the same container. That took a little bit of uh, doing, but we were able to use that base container and then customize it the way we wanted, and then we had our custom container for that project we were working on. So the other thing I mentioned there was that just the speed at which these things are updated. Uh, NVIDIA is updating these containers once a month, so you don't have to. So every time a new driver comes out, or a new framework is updated, or indeed a new GPU comes out, you know that NVIDIA's got your back there, and you, know, you can grab the latest container and continue your work without having to worry about it. So that then led to Jensen saying, well, now, this is great. We've got all these containers, and everyone's using them. Well, let's, you know, don't just keep this to ourselves. We'll get it out there for the world. So we developed the NVIDIA GPU cloud. So this actually has two aspects to it. The first one is what I've been talking about, this centralized GPU accelerated container registry. And that's accessible now, and you can go and use it to your heart's desire. The other aspect is this ability to pick where you want to run. And that might not sound like much, uh, but it, it becomes really important when you start doing going from experimentation to deployment. So suddenly, uh, you've done all your work. You've experimented with a small data set on your local machine. And it's working great. And now you're, you're ready. With NVIDIA GPU Cloud, literally, you just pick from a drop down. And you can push that to uh, your company's uh, server room or out to the cloud. It's very simple to use. And yeah, <clears throat> it's great. We save so much time with it. You can sign up for this today at nvidia.com slash cloud. And uh, anyone who's getting into this field, I strongly encourage it. I, uh, I can't stress it enough. It will save you so much time. And uh, it, you know, uh, tears of blood have been put into this. So uh, t take that and run with it. So now we change gears slightly to what I'm sort of more passionate about, which is inferencing. And when I think of computer games, and I have my computer uh, game design hat on, uh, deep learning just has so many wonderful possibilities. I've put some up here, but you know, th think of this. You, know, you have like a, a massive multiplayer game at the moment. You walk up to an NPC. You walk up to the innkeeper. You click him. He has like four text response. You can give two answers, and then he gives two answers to that. OK, that's, that's fine. And then maybe I turn to another NPC. I have no interaction with that. Now if we sort of cast our mind forward a little, and, and indeed not very far, rather than doing things scripted in that rules-based approach, let's have a knowledge base about the game. In that knowledge base, we put all the law and all the knowledge about that universe. And all the NPCs can now access that and pull out data. And indeed, you can take it further, and suddenly, um, I'm in you know, Guild X, because I'm an Australian. And uh, this particular innkeeper knows I'm in that guild. And now he's going to give me misinformation. Whereas if I'd gone to the, uh, the, the hotel guy across the street, he would have given me the correct information. So as a game designer, when I start thinking about deep learning, you know, my mind kind of goes crazy. 
has so many different possibilities. And um, text-to-speech is another great one where suddenly every character can speak. You know, we can't afford to go and we've got 20,000 NPCs in the game. We can't go and record 20,000 voice actors. You know, that's just, you know, cost prohibitive, you know, too much size, waveforms all over the place. That, that's not going to work. But if we have text-based uh, uh, audio, or text that gets converted to audio, suddenly every single NPC in the game could, uh, could potentially talk to the player. So that's really exciting. And the, the TTS systems are getting very good. And I definitely think within one to two years, we'll start to see them good enough to be put into games, to have accents, to perhaps even regionalize them and have different parameters to, to have different uh, sounding characters. The final one I'll mention uh, just briefly uh, is one that I, I must admit I did not think of, but is a great one. Uh, I was talking to a developer, and they, they said, we find that when the players are stressed, they really enjoy it, but they can't be too stressed. So can we analyze based on uh, camera feed or the audio that they're speaking over their microphone, or even just the way they're interacting with the keyboard? Can we use deep learning to analyze the stress of the player and then adjust the game so that you know, we keep them in that perfect window where they're really enjoying the game? And again, Deep learning is going to make that possible very, very quickly. If you are thinking of doing uh, deep learning or inferencing in your game, it's going to have to be fast. And this is actually uh, a lot of what my team do. We take that knowledge we had from optimizing graphics, optimizing shaders, looking for hotspots, and now we're applying that to inferencing. And one of my guys, uh, Don, is speaking at GTC on Monday about that very topic. The other sort of large change that's just been announced uh, by Microsoft is Windows ML. So doing inferencing on Windows, uh, it can be done. Uh, we have several demos down at the booth uh, right now that are running inferencing on Windows. But you have to use a bit of a mix of uh, skills. You can use direct compute. You can use CUDA. You, know, you have to sort of work around the problem. With Windows ML, this is a fully fledged Microsoft certified API part of DirectX 12, and uh, it's tightly integrated. So you'll be able to make uh, Windows ML and DirectML calls uh, without having to worry about um, you know, a different language or uh, overhead and switching to, to um, other ways of doing inferencing. It's going to accept the Onyx uh, interchange format, uh, which might not mean anything to anyone just yet, but it's being adopted by all the, well, many of the major frameworks such that if you do your development and your experimentation and your training, uh, then you have that model. You will then be able to export to Onyx and put it into other frameworks, or in this case, bring it into Windows ML and execute uh, on, on your client machines. Uh, there are a couple of talks that took place on Windows ML. They were both this morning, but you'll be able to get them later uh, by looking in the vault. And finally, it is coming out uh, later in the year to consumers as part of a Windows 10 update. So the other side of work my team does is on developer tools. We actually announced uh, the beta version of this last year. And I uh, just wanted to revisit that uh, because we've made some changes. Uh, we've been enhancing and improving the tools all year. And I'll run through them quickly now. But the other thing we've started to do is make the tool available as a client-side library. So this can then be better integrated into development pipelines and production pipelines, and indeed into tools if you have any uh, content creation tools. Uh, if you're interested, you can sign up at the, the website there, gwmt.com. Just fill out the form and, and note that you're interested in the client side library, and uh, one of the team will get back to you. So the tools that we have so far, uh, one is called TwoShot. That's a uh, material synthesis tool that allows you to take two photos of a flat surface, and the material information is pulled from that. And you get a, a, a diffuse texture. Well, actually, I'll, I'll show you over here. So you take a flash image and what, what we call the guide, or an image with no flash. These are pixel aligned. And then they run through the algorithm. And you end up with a BRDF and a diffuse and 
basically all the surface information. So you can then very quickly, if you're trying to make a lifelike game or use uh, something, we've had some people use it for architectural simulations or interior design, and you want an accurate representation of a surface, uh, this is a, a great tool for that. The other tool we have is what we call the texture multiplier. And uh, we've been working, actually, again, with Brian's team. If anyone saw the uh, infilling, we've been looking at ways to use that as well. But this particular tool uh, takes an input and then gives variations. So you can feed it in. Uh, it's, it's very good with natural, uh, organic uh, textures like rocks, leaves, grass, moss, um, pebbles, this type of thing. And if you're trying to make uh, variations, uh, it can also do tiling for you as well. So for instance, if you have a, a desert terrain of sand and you're getting you know, the typical terrain seams, uh, you might want to use this uh, tool to, to help do the tiling. The final tool, and this is actually the first one that we've, we've got running as a client-side library, is the super resolution or intelligent upscaling tool. Uh, we presented quite a, a detailed um, presentation last year, so if you want to go and hear how it actually works and um, hear from the guys who actually, who actually uh, created the model, uh, have a look at, at the website there and you can see the recording from last year. But basically what this does is instead of using a filter-based approach, which is the typical method, you know, have this many pixels, I want to go up to this many pixels, and I do some sort of intelligent uh, averaging, or I tap around the pixel and you know, pick the nearest color, or something like that. This takes a, a, a different approach and uses a deep learning model called an autoencoder. So the autoencoder takes as input the image. It then uh, pulls features and creates a higher dimensional representation of the image, and then funnels that back down to RGB and the number of pixels that you specify. So I'll show you a, a comparison of that now. <clears throat> so this is a, a bilinear filter. This is a bicubic filter. And then this is the super resolution tool. So you can see it's a far greater, I'll do that again for you. So it's bilinear, bicubic, and yeah. super resolution. So you can see, especially around curves, uh, it understands that uh, you know, the font, even though it's blue uh, text and, and white background, it doesn't put an average of the two colors between it. It actually understands that X is an X, and it needs to be kept as a hard, hard line. And that's because it has this higher dimensional representation of all the interesting features uh, uh, in the image. So on that very note, this is a still version, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to Gav now to talk about some of the applications he's, he's done on the real-time side. Thanks, Andrew. All right, so what are some of the direct practical applications of this that we can actually use right now today? And one of those is remastering. So my team in Toronto, among other things, is responsible for bringing more games to NVIDIA's Shield platform. And uh, we've done a lot of work bringing older console titles to Shield, particularly for, for some releases in China we've done recently. And when you're doing that, the great thing is, of course, that new hardware is able to render these games at much higher resolutions. We can, we can render uh, a game at, at 1080p that was originally uh, 640 by 480. So obviously when you're doing that, your, your uh, geometry resolution is increased, but you also need to increase texture resolution to, to have a good looking experience. Uh, and so that we've, we've done some of that in, in conjunction with the tools that Andrew's team has done, also touched up by some artists. But there's another issue, and that issue is that many older games use cutscenes that are rendered at least partially using the game engine at low resolution. And in some cases, uh, the original assets used to create these cutscenes are, are no longer available. And so, therefore, we need to go a step further and do video super resolution. Now, unfortunately, I'm not able to actually show you the imagery from the 
the game in question uh, because it's only just going to be released very, very soon, if not today. If you happen to live in China and own a shield, I would encourage you to look at the, the new releases and you'll see some pretty cool stuff. But this is an example of an aliased image that where we took a, a video, uh, Big Buck Bunny, which is a nice uh, open source video that you can use for a lot of analysis purposes. We purposefully lowered the resolution in a way that would, be, that would give us a similar kind of aliased effect that we would get out of uh, a, an older cutscene rendered image. And we've applied some of the same techniques of the super resolution network to clean this up. And so here's the result of, of that. So you can look at, at things like the, the eyes, the edges around the eyes. This network is really, really good at uh, turning blocky edges into really nice smooth lines. It's not perfect. You can also see that it, it loses a little bit of, of detail perhaps in, in some of the, the fur, but it's pretty good. So here's the result when we actually uh, have it side by side in a video. So on the left you have a, a bicubic upscale, and on the right you have a D upscale of the movie. So you can really see some of the additional detail in, in the grass, uh, the, the, the blade of grass right here. Look at, look at the edge on the, on the tree here. Is that one? Again with the grass, and, and you can see some of the, the, the butterfly outline. Uh, it just looks so much better. And so when, you, when you're going from these very old uh, 640 or 480 videos, being able to upscale, you can get some really fantastic results. So another example of uh, practical applications that are, that are very close to us is using deep learning for animation. Uh, some of you may have been at a talk that Daniel Holden gave yesterday about deep learning and character animation. And uh, there were a number of really interesting papers released last year on this topic. And we've been following all that work internally and experimenting with it ourselves. So uh, this paper uh, that Daniel Holden and, and, and a few others uh, put together for SIGGRAPH last year is really a breakthrough in using motion capture to teach a deep learning network how humans move. And the results are, are, are really ones that speak for themselves in terms of uh, the way that the network is able to blend between different states. None of this is pre-canned animation. This is entirely a neural network trained directly with human motion with the understanding of uh, learning how humans move uh, to, to cross rough terrain and do other, other motion. And it's, it's some pretty, pretty amazing results. So what kind of applications can we have for this? So obviously, games is one, uh, and, and we'll show you some pretty cool stuff later on that note. But there are many others as well that we're interested in. Some of the work that my team in Toronto does exists at the crossover between gaming and various other applications of, of AI. So uh, another one of those might be simulating crowds. Another one that's, that's really important, especially given some of the, the news, the unfortunate news that's happened this week, is auto simulation. If you're, if you're trying to run a, a neural network to learn how to drive a car, it's really important to be able to simulate what that network is going to do before you deploy it in a, in a vehicle. And so uh, we do a lot of work in this, and many, many of the companies involved in autonomous vehicles work, do similar things. But having a really good model for how human pedestrians move around is obviously critically important. Another one, which is pretty cool, is human-robot interaction. So NVIDIA is doing a lot of work in robotics. There's a project we have called Isaac, where we're 
trying to create great deep learning environments for, for training robots. In order for us to ever have direct interactions with you know, the kinds of, of, of droids you might see in, 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 in films, we, we don't want that to happen behind a, a glass wall. But given the fact that robots are large and can be, can be dangerous, until the time that robots have a really good understanding of how humans move around, a robot's not going to know that it can't move its arm through the path of somebody running by. So being able to have, again, simulated models of humans is really important. Another gaming-related area that we can apply this to is our, our holodeck system. So holodeck is a VR system for shared experiences in VR. Obviously, we track the, the head and two hands. And right now, we have this kind of scenario where we have these, these virtual characters in your, in your shared world, but we have no legs because there are no leg sensors. So we can potentially apply this kind of technology to, uh, to generate motion for these characters as well. So how does this face functional network system actually work? Well, the first order of business, as Andrew said earlier, is data. So you have to have a corpus of, of motion capture data. There's lots of data available from, uh, uh, for free that's out there on the internet. Uh, CMU has a great database available. Um, <clears throat> quality levels may not, may not necessarily be you know, what, what, is, what is ideal for, for games these days, but it can be a good starting point for playing around and, and looking at things. We've done some of our own uh, capture with, with some partners from uh, Fox's VFX lab that we've been playing with. And you, you collect uh, a set of data. You can see, in, in this case, there's lots of obstacles that we have the, the people move around and, and, and climb over and things like that so that we get a, a really good, diverse amount of human motion data. Then we need to label that data. So it's not enough just to have this, this random data. If we're, run, if we're doing a gaming scenario, we want to have an understanding, we want the network to have an understanding of the distinction between running and walking and, and other types of motion, which we call gates uh, for the purpose of, of this work. Another really critical thing to label is, is the phase. Uh, what part of the walk cycle are you in? Left foot, right foot, intermediate. And then, of course, the footstep positions. Where do the feet actually hit the ground? Next is terrain fitting. So if you imagine motion capture for somebody walking up or down a staircase, you have one set of, of terrain that, that they've actually walked up or down. But we want to show the network that the individual poses that the, the character uh, can assume may actually be far more varied or on, on, on different terrain. So if you look at if you look at these different different terrain patches, all of these are terrain patches where the character lifting up his right foot would be the right thing to do. And this is what we call data augmentation in, in deep learning. There's a lot of work where you have a little bit of data, but if you kind of mess around with it a little bit, you can give the deep learning network more to think about, more to, more to learn statistically. And it's, it's more robust to do this. You get, a, you get a network that generalizes better. One thing that's very different about this phased function, phase function neural network than a lot of other networks is that the weights in the network are actually variable. Most of the time with a neural network, you'll, you'll train a network and the weights will be what they are and that's it. The phase function neural network and the beauty of, of this approach is that, <clears throat> excuse me, you actually end up training effectively four different networks, one for each quarter of the walk cycle. And the network learns what motion looks like within that part of the walk cycle. And then based on the phase of the walk cycle the character is in, the weights in the network are automatically varied. There's a few different ways to, to actually do the, the calculation of those weights, one of which was to, is to pre-compute a wide set of weights for, for many different possible uh, phases, or you can actually do a spline interpolation at runtime. Doing that requires additional computing. 
And then lastly, of course, is, is, the, is the runtime inferencing. So once you've trained the network, <clears throat> what is it you're actually trying to get the network to tell you? Well, you, you give it as input the, uh, the current joint positions and velocities where they were at from the, the previous frame. You also give it input the trajectory that you'd like the character to move in and the heights of where that character is moving, as well as heights uh, near it. And, and that's important for, for some of the effects that uh, the network encodes. And as output, the network gives you the next set of joint positions, velocities, rotations, and so on. So we did an implementation of this. Uh, this is uh, the PFNN up and running. Uh, this is running in, in UE4, so we have the, the standard UE4 pawn. And again, none of this animation is, is pre-canned. It all comes from the network having learned what human motion looks like and, and plausible motions as the, as the character moves around. Uh, makes little steps down, little steps up, and, and generally does a, does a pretty good job. Uh, I particularly like this next little bit of a video where it, it's climbing up the slope and uh, actually puts his hands down there to, to balance. So we're NVIDIA, so we like things to run on GPUs. So what does this look like if we run it on a GPU? What, what can we actually do if we run this inferencing on a GPU? And the answer is, of course, lots and lots of characters. So uh, we can run uh, up to 500 characters on a, on a, on a, modern, on a modern GPU. Uh, obviously, we're not doing any kind of character inter interpenetration testing, but we're, we're running 500 of these, of these models simultaneously. Now, if you look closely, you might have noticed something about some of these. What, what exactly is it that we're, that we're seeing that's wrong here? Well, and the answer is physics. This network knows nothing about physics. All it knows about physics is that you know, whatever was fed to it in the initial data. So if you're using the PFNN technique, you have to have some kind of inverse kinematics to fix this up afterwards. So in, in some of the work that we've done, we've used iKinema, we've used some custom stuff as well. Uh, you have to have some kind of, some kind of fix up. But what if you didn't? What if you, what if you actually wanted to train, you just apply physics, apply the, the motion not as direct positions, but as motor control information? And if you just you naively take that and, and try it with uh, existing thing, this is what you get. <laughs> so we're telling it, we're telling it, you know, uh, at very, you know, it's, it's trying to turn, you know, we, we give it a, a motion to turn, it's trying to turn, but it has no balance. And that's obviously a problem for, for, for future work. So another significant piece of work came out last year called Deep Loco, where um, this, this is a, a group from the University of British, British Columbia that uh, was, was doing the application of physics into these systems. So how does this work? Well, the primary methodology that this uses is a type of deep learning called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, the network gets a reward and uh, tries to maximize that reward. So you, you create a reward function that defines what, what it means to, to do well. So obviously for something that's, that's trying to do animation, continuing to stand, continue to be upright is important. The Deep Loco network also has, separates out the idea of a low level controller that's responding to, uh, to physics and, and trying to, to match motion. It also has a high level controller that is, that is trying to generate some kind of higher level footstep plan to do some particular task. And the, the Deep Loco folks customize this for various different tasks. So this is, this is the Deep Loco network in practice. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the reward function being plotted. So this, this guy's doing not too bad. Um, the low-level controller is just trying to match random footstep points. Um, this guy is able to, uh, 
to do a reasonable job on, on terrain variation. But what's, of course, different about this is it's not perfect, and it doesn't always do the right thing. It's, uh, it's pretty robust. You can, you can throw things at it, and it, uh, it manages to keep going, which is pretty cool. For a little while, anyway. There we go. I like this demo because I get to make robots fall down. And it's, it's awesome. Someday they may punish us for that. Yeah, so this, this guy, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this is an example of a high-level task that this network has been trained to do. So the high-level controller has been trained to, to try and kick the ball to, uh, to the red spot. And the low-level controller is just providing the level uh, control to keep the character upright and, and follow uh, human motion, human-like motion. So we've been experimenting with, with this uh, technique internally. Uh, we, we started out some stuff without any mocap data. So we just used the deep local reward function that they were using for trying to keep the character upright and rewarding it for, uh, for moving ahead. And uh, this was the, the very first results that we got uh, late last year. Just lots of fun. It has learned to walk. So this, is, this is actually a really interesting point in, in deep learning. Uh, you can think of the solution space for the, the, the giant network of parameters you have as, as having many solutions. This is, this is clearly one solution that provides the character with reward for, for walking and not falling down. However, it's not one that any of us would recognize as a, as a viable walk. Um, it's found uh, a local minima, and it, it hasn't really been able to get out of that. So that's an, that's an interesting ongoing problem with reinforcement learning. How do you make sure that the networks are able to explore the wider possible solution space? And there's a lot of active research going on there. Uh, we then added motion capture data, and we said, all right, now try and match the motion capture data. And uh, we actually have some pretty good results doing that. Now, what you're seeing here is the training environment that we have. We're actually training 100 of these agents simultaneously. And uh, we, we train those networks, and we take the best ones, and we train those some more. Uh, and that's how, over time, we're able to get some, some, some pretty good results. So uh, we then said, all right, that's, that's great. Let's, let's try some uneven, uneven terrain. Uh, uneven terrain is certainly more challenging. Uh, we, we saw the, the Deep Loco example with just a very simple slope was, was not necessarily easy for it to navigate. So, all right, you know, any kind of video game is going to have, many video games are going to have complex terrain. Uh, we, we saw the, the PFNN demo with the character scaling a lot of uneven terrain. Let's see what happens if we, if we do this. But again, we didn't give it motion capture as an example. And so I, I like this one too. So again, it has, it has found a, a local minima that, that gets it walking on, on uneven terrain um, with simulated physics, but it's not necessarily one that you'd, you'd yet want to put in your game. Um, but it does succeed for a reasonably long time before it <laughs> finally falls down. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 there's some interesting possibilities out of this stuff. So then we, we again added, added motion capture data in this. And uh, again, we got a, a pretty good result here. But uh, I, I, this, this guy's just a little too cool for school. <laughs> so. Got a bit of a swagger to his step. We have got to have some, some snapping as he as he walks. So we have some other folks in the company uh, looking at at some similar things. Also looking at uh, interactions between multiple characters, which obviously in a gaming kind of setup is 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 pretty cool. And uh, uh, use a different environment for for some of this work. But in this case, again, it was a reinforcement learning type of situation. Uh, but uh, this one was actually done without motion capture, but with some different parameters to the, the reward function, one of which was we have um, multiple characters that are actually chasing one another, and uh, they're rewarded for knocking another character down without themselves falling down. Yeah. 
and this is just enormous fun. <laughs> so, not not necessarily ready yet for for integration into a game, but definitely fun to watch. <laughs> So um, I'm going to take a little segue now and, and show uh, a demo. We have this demo running in our, um, in our booth. Uh, so you can, you can come in and have a look. Uh, so this is, this is not any of the reinforcement learning based demos, but this is uh, an attempt at a, a small sort of pseudo game using uh, the, the PFNN technique. So uh, we have our character, in this case, uh, we're retargeting from some motion capture to this uh, somewhat animated looking boy, uh, cartoonish rather, and uh, you can see it uh, you know, moving, clambering around these rocks. It's, it's never had any, any previous experience with, uh, with them, and we can do some cool things. So I'm, I mentioned earlier the, the left and right tests. So you can see there the, the green and yellow lines is where it's, it's testing the height uh, that it sends, sends into the network. And based on the fact that that height is, there's a big height difference between where the boy is standing and uh, the, the other sides, it decides to, the network itself is deciding to uh, balance. Um, jumping in this, in this system is a little bit more difficult. Uh, we've, told it to try and jump over that rock. Um, again, the network gets to decide. Yeah, there we go, there's a little bit of a hop there. The network gets to decide what a, what a jump looks like. And again, uh, because of course, we wanna show off the power of, of being able to do this uh, using GPU inferencing. In this, in this demo, we have a, we call the spaceship down and the boy uh, has found himself in a, in a valley with a crashed spaceship filled with robots, all of whom are, are animated using this technique. And so we can kind of scramble up some of these rocks and watch the robots follow us. So all of, all of these robots are being inferenced at runtime on the GPU. And it's actually pretty efficient. This is running on a, a 1060 laptop. So it does, it does pretty well. So DL animation, even, even with some of the, the caveats requiring inverse kinematics uh, and, and other things, you can get some pretty interesting results right now with this. So one of the reasons that we're, we're showing this off, we, we don't have we're not, we're not announcing any kind of uh, uh, product or, or SDK with this. Uh, we are we're just playing around, but we're really interested in understanding what developers uh, are, are, are thinking about as far as applying this kind of technique to their game. We understand that animation is a uh, is a very difficult and, and complex task, and uh, we'd love to have any feedback from anyone ab about whether these techniques might be interesting for your game and uh, what we might be able to do to cooperate together. And I will leave you with, uh, before questions, with uh, just the reminder again that GTC attendees, you can save 20%. Uh, we have that gaming AI track on Monday. Uh, the code to use is down here. We definitely welcome everyone to, to come by and, and learn more about deep learning. Both Andrew and I will be there and uh, uh, we're happy to answer any other questions you might have now. Thanks very much. There is a microphone just in the center. Um, we do, there's no immediate session following this so we can ha handle some questions. Um, there's also a, a raffle for the 1080. So shall I do that first? Yeah, why don't we do, why don't we do that first? We'll do the raffle. Uh, actually, wait a minute. No, no let's not run. do the raffle first, because if we do the raffle first, then we may have an exodus. It will be difficult to hear questions. So <laughs> if you'd like to participate in the raffle, uh, stick, stick around, around for a bit.
Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any research in this phase function neural network area where it's multiple characters instead of just one. So you could maybe have phase based animation of like character interactions. Right, absolutely. So, so the, the, the deep loco work is, is really interesting along these lines. They don't use uh, a phase function neural network exactly. They actually, they actually have some stuff that's very similar. Uh, it doesn't interpolate the, the weights between the, the, the different phases. They just take four phases and they, they, they do a, a very simple uh, uh, bilinear interpolation rather than a, a spline interpolation between them. Uh, but because that's a reinforcement learning based approach and because it's physics based, that ha has, I think, some really interesting implications for multi character interactions that include physics. You obviously, in order to have multi character interactions, you obviously want to have physics. The, the demo that, that I just showed doesn't actually have any character interactions. We, we, we avoid the characters uh, colliding with one another, one another with some slightly higher level. Uh, traditional fixed AI to, to, to keep the, the robots following the boy and keep them away from one another. But absolutely having, having physics and having reinforcement learning to have the characters learn how to interact is, is interesting and that's stuff that we're, we're thinking about. Uh, I was just curious in terms of uh, penalties for some of the walk animations you were talking about, basically go forward. Is, is what you were investigating. Uh, some of those local mini minima that you were getting caught in, I'm just curious if you guys have looked at um, trying to put a penalty on the amount of energy used. Right, so that's, that's, that's definitely one of the, the categories that's often used for, uh, for locomotion reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't actually recall off the top of my head whether that was one of the penalties in, in some of the, the work that my team was doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's, it's critical. Um, uh, there's, you know, keep going forward, follow the motion, you know, maintain low energy. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of, that's, that's <laughs> a, lot a lot of work for, for the, the network to learn. Yeah, we but absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Head, all right. head, head height, joint height, yeah. all, all sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Uh, how much of the compute in the GPU is used for graphics versus uh, the deep learning inference? And what, um, you know, what, what a kind of additional development uh, in the inference itself would ever cause the, um, uh, the compute used by inference to exceed that of graphics? Right, so, so I, I don't actually know the answer to that question. Uh, we, we, we finished this demo uh, Tuesday afternoon uh, and, and have not spent a lot of time on, on optimization. It does run pretty well on, on this 1060 laptop, so uh, that, that you know, uh, speaks to to that to some degree. Yeah. Uh, we I can talk more generally if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, generally to your point, um, uh, my team does a lot, lot of work on minimizing the amount of time inferencing takes, but it's, it's like all graphics, you know, uh, or all games. Every time you add one more graphical effect, that's going to affect your frame rate. So it's always a balancing act. And the same is going to apply for deep learning. You, you, you're going to have to balance your deep learning, <coughs> excuse me, with your graphics. And uh, uh, that's something we've had to do for years, and that'll, that'll continue forward. Hi, I had a question about the uh, NVIDIA PFN and demo that you guys showed, that you guys implemented. So um, there was a term being used specifically that the locomotion on the player was not pre-canned animation. But my, I wanted to clarify my understanding. So, isn't PFNN just a matching querying system for the meta tag labels on the mocap data? So was that demo showing something different or is that still mocap animation that is just tagged up and this PFNN network is matching that? So I, I wouldn't describe it as, as matching exactly. Uh, the, the network is not learning to match a sequence of, of motion capture, so it's not learning. So when I, when I talked about that, if, if you if you read Daniel Holden's talk yesterday, he talked about uh, Ubisoft having 15,000 different animations that their animation tree went down for, for for different things. The the network is not learning which of those you know sequences to match. It's actually learning about motion in general, and it's able to make uh, to to do inferencing combining motion together that it may not have have seen before at all. Uh, 
What we're doing is we're, we're feeding it this information. It's learning, it's learning about how the joints move right. from one frame to another, and it is guessing based on the input coming in what those joints should do. It's not, it's not motion matching. It's not stitching them together. It's actually generating motion from what it has learned directly. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, go ahead. So, when you're saying it's generating motion, uh, I just want to clarify: is, does that mean it's generating new animation data, or because with the player controller, it's all about matching the intent of the player, right? You want to match aesthetically. So, is it when you say it's you know cre learning about motion? Does that specifically mean new motion data is being created, or it's trying to find the best fitting motion from the mocap data? It, it, it sort of does both. It's trying. It's it's it is creating new data. It's not going to always give you something that has seen exactly before, right? Because it's it's not possible to to have given it all potential input before. So it is trying to guess the the best fitting motion, and that may not be something it has seen before. Yeah. But if there is something that is close to what it's seen before, it is more likely to to reproduce that. We'll do one more question and then I'll do the raffle. And then if there are other questions, you're more than welcome to come up after. I'll be quick. Sure. Gav, question for you. I'm going to suffer this question you. I was going to ask Holden yesterday. When you do the, ch the training for the different phases in the PFNN, you present all the training data for a particular phase to each of the networks in the different phases with the time, with the time, as a, uh, the time in the phase as a parameter. Is that right? Uh, Yes, the the, fa the phase is you know the, the network is is given uh, for any given frame of, of input data, mm -hmm. it's given what phase is associated with that frame. Yeah, but there's there's not like one phase that's there's not like one frame that's tra trained in each of the phases. It's all the frames within that phase, right? We we so so there's a question of batching and and, and how you arrange. Do you do you train you know with with you know pi first and then you know, and then half pi and then zero. You know, there, there's questions around batching, and I, I, I'd have to talk to the folks who, who did the actual training to, to, to know whether we batched it like that or, or whether we presented it overall. I, I do know that one of the things we did was we've trained the PFNN using uh, a, uh, we've taken CMU mocap data as a start, and rather than training the entire you know, hour and 20 minutes or so, that Holden trained with. We've actually been able to train a PFNN with about five minutes of that data, but randomly sampled uh, mm. sets of frames between within within that. Doesn't doesn't look as good with five minutes of data versus versus more. But we're, whether we're batching all the grouped phases together, I'm I'm not sure. Okay, we'll do the. Uh, well, thank thank you everyone for the questions. Actually, that was that was really good. All right. So Gav will do the honors here. All right, good mix here. And the winner is keep this coupon. No, uh, the winner is 383924. Ooh, Up the back. The there we go. Thank you very much. Thanks Congratulations. Very much. Thanks, all. Have a good show.